Ah, finally we're here. After three weeks of watching Batman movies, starting all the way back with 1966's Adam West, I worked my way through Keaton, Kilmer, Clooney, Catwoman, Bale, and now we arrive with the Bat Flick, and of course, the new Batman movie starring Robert the Patman Pattinson. I've been open over the years concerning my views on the modern Marvel Cinematic Universe. However, I've never really spoken on what I thought about Warner Brothers' attempt to compete with Marvel in that same vertical. This has been a wonderful project to work on, and today we round it all off. So, without further ado, we're finally here. I'm Toy Not Mark, and kicking things off, this is my review of 2016's Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice. This was an interesting film to start this video off with. In 2016, I was strolling around with my then girlfriend at the time when the thought dawned on us to go and watch the new Batman vs. Superman movie. The title sounded exciting, albeit a bit dumb, but we had a few hours to kill, and this seemed like an idea as good as any. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. One instance I specifically recall from that screening was my ex Linia Cross asking me who a particular character was on screen, and I replied, <laughs> I have absolutely no idea what's going on. Suffice it to say, we did not have a good experience, and by the time we got back into the car to head back home, it was a distant memory never to pop into my head ever again, I thought. Until now. When AG and I were mapping out which movies I was going to be covering and when, he made certain to tell me not to watch the theatrical cut of this film which I had seen in the cinema, but to instead go with something called the Ultimate Edition, basically an alternate cut of the film, telling me that the difference was going to be night and day, and to tell you the truth, I didn't believe him entirely. I mean, I trust AJ and I expected a slightly better experience, but still an overall negative one. Spoiler alert, I was wrong. What I once thought was an incomprehensibly boring and rushed film has suddenly transformed into a fun superhero flick, Leagues, pardon the pun, above that what I saw prior and certainly better than what I was expecting. And I can't stress this enough. If you haven't seen this alternate cut of the film, then I'd honestly say give it a look. It completely changed my perspective on the story. Now, this isn't to say that this film is without its flaws. Glaring flaws. But we'll get to that. Batman. Before tackling this three-hour behemoth of a movie, AJ also provided me with some required reading. Zack Schneider, the director behind this film, has said an inspiration behind this movie was a comic released in 1986 called The Dark Knight Returns, in which a much older, more aggressive Batman contends with tremendous loss, much more violence, and even Superman. Now, with that said, it's far from a one-to-one -one adaptation, but there are some interesting parallels. The introduction or credit sequence of the film's opening is taken almost shot for shot from the comic, complete with pearl necklace beads flying. I am, however, glad that they glossed over the origin this time around, as I've seen it way too many times in the last three weeks between the comics and films I've seen. And to be honest, I think that's for the best. We know who Batman is at this point, and his portrayal in this film is something I'm very excited to touch on. The way this movie finally commits a horrifying Batman to the screen is, to me, one of its strongest assets. A dark, hulking mask that has villains convinced they saw a genuine monster. One of the earliest scenes with Batman rescuing prisoners is constructed like a horror movie. One by one, you hear the screams of men taken out as the police officer scales the stairs. He turns and for a split second you see the Batman before he scuttles across the ceiling away from view. While Batman taking out villains in the shipyard in Batman Begins goes a long way in selling the horror of what Batman represents, it's here that it's fully realized in arguably the most comic accurate direction. It extends beyond the horror too. The whole no notion that Bruce Wayne is the mask is something I'm aware is the most obvious take in the world, but I really enjoyed the way it was utilized during the party scene where Bruce first meets Clark. Under the masquerade of a drunk billionaire, he, James Bonds, his way into the restricted area to do Batman things. And that's an aspect that even the Nolan trilogy often didn't capture. Of course, the portrayal here isn't perfect. In fact, I'm aware it's incredibly divisive. Years back, when I first watched this film, something I took issue with, or at least felt stood in my way in connecting with the Bat flick, was the killing he otherwise commits unto criminals. He shoots them, blows them up, and even brands them. And while it makes for a cool visual, the fact that the brand is effectively a death sentence once a marked criminal is sent to jail kinda irritated me. As I watched it now, however, with a greater awareness of Batman and all the incarnations he's had over the years, I don't find myself nearly as bothered. Batman used to kill pretty ruthlessly in his early incarnations, and even after he developed his moral code that's become a foundation of the character, there have still been many instances where he's killed. One of the wonderful things about comics is that different writers can offer different takes on a singular character, and I think that's the best way to take it here. Admittedly, however, watching all of these films back to back certainly makes this quite a jarring take, though. 
It's as though Christian Bale popped up in a fourth movie taking people out ruthlessly without the development to showcase what brought him to this point. And I think that's a large part of why this bothers many people, including myself to a minor degree. You're dropped right in on a post-Robin death Batman, one that's lost his code and moral compass without quite understanding how he ended up this way in the first place. He's an unyielding, unkind, and violent person in this film, but not without purpose, and I think the way it's portrayed overall does just about work. His actions are not glorified or accepted as permissible. The entire point of this version of Batman is to highlight how Bruce has fallen as a human being. There's a brilliant quote from Jeremy Irons' Alfred that speaks to this very flaw in this film. He says, and I quote, That's how it starts, sir. The fear, the rage, the feeling of powerlessness that turns good men cruel. He's judging Bruce in this instance, and this very aspect of who Bruce is, this cruelty, this savagery, this lack of moral ethic, is exactly what this story serves to draw attention to and ultimately serves as the mechanism from which the climax's disaster stems from. Superman. Something I haven't really spoken about much in this series at all has been Superman and my experience with the character. Growing up, Spider-Man was always my number one favourite. I identified with the character massively and to this day his films can bring tears to my eyes. And while Superman isn't that nostalgic for me personally, he is for my little brother. Growing up in the 90s, my little brother adored Superman. He had the toys, watched the movies, and bought those tacky knockoff Superman costumes that never look good. He would even watch that really old but incredibly well animated Superman TV show from the 1940s too. He had all of those episodes on videotape and he watched them so much, he literally wore out the tape. And while I couldn't share that same enthusiasm for the character back then that he did, today I'm still delighted he was able to have that sort of experience identifying with or finding solace in that character. In case some of you are watching this in the future, during the spring of 2022, Russia launched an invasion of Ukraine that spun the world into a whirlwind. At the moment of writing this, there are some horrific scenes, reports, and imagery coming out of Ukraine. However, in that same vein, there too have been some heroic stories. One that's been making the rounds as of late has been that of the, quote, Ghost of Kiev. The Ghost of Kyiv is a folk tale that's been given to a yet unnamed pilot of the Ukrainian military responsible for allegedly taking down numerous Russian fighter jets. Is the story true? Possibly. Is the story fabricated? Possibly too. To tell you the truth, I honestly don't know, but what I do know is the impact such a story can have on the terrified little children that are hunkered down in subway stations, bunkers, and basements across that country. Hoping and praying for the war to end and for their dads and brothers to come home and for their worlds to return to normal. In the last week, the ghost of Kiev has become something of a mythical force. And this is what a superhero is. Hope. In the 1940s, as countless husbands, brothers and uncles went off to fight in the Second World War, not knowing if they would ever return again, for millions in the United States, Superman, as well as other heroes of the time, helped to alleviate that anxiety, injecting, if only for a moment, some hope that someone remarkable out there could take on impossible odds, and not only overcome, but save the day. That's who Superman was for my little brother. While Spider-Man's appeal for me came from his relatability and the themes of responsibility, for my brother, Superman was the one hero that, when faced with two bad options, could always invent a third great one. There's a short sequence of scenes in this film depicting what sort of force for good Superman can be. And since seeing the film back in 2016, one shot has always stayed with me. Amidst the thrashing of the rising tide, hurricane winds, and lack of help, a family is trapped atop the roof of their home. They have no options. Until... There he is, the last hope, the option C that shouldn't exist, but does. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that this is who Superman needs to be. In fact, I'm by no means an authority on Superman. I have not read any of his comics and know very little about his history. Instead, I am just saying that this was my exposure to the character in my childhood, and now as an adult, while I understand that a lot of people don't like the godlike imagery he's depicted with, I personally did like the vision behind a lot of these ideas, despite there being much more to this character than I grew up with initially. Superman in this universe kills people. I feel conflicted on this topic somewhat. And perhaps that's the point. If only one person had a point of contention in this fight between Superman and Batman, then it wouldn't be nearly as interesting. And so, seeing as I have no real idea what the definitive or de facto Superman is, I'll accept this incarnation of the character. Clark Kent, or Kal-El, in this film, I think is an interesting one. 
He's very much a small town middle America sort of man and armed with those values struggles to come to terms with what his role in society ought to be with the abilities he possesses and the responsibilities that come bundled with such otherworldly powers. If with great power comes great responsibility in Spider-Man, then in Superman with absolute power there must also come absolute levels of responsibility. And to his credit he tries in earnest to stand for something greater and important for the here and now while being faced with the grim reality his actions have wrought onto this world. So could you if it was 1938, but it's not 1938. I really liked this line, and I think it really speaks to the character and the turmoil he seems to have found himself in. When Superman was created in 1938, the landscape was far simpler, asking far less of the Superman character. Feats that were fantastic and enemies that were simple and clearly cut made up the order of the day. Within the pages of the old comic book, things were far less complicated, and by extension, far less collateral damage was caused. Things are no longer simple nowadays for this character, which is exactly the struggle the modern incarnation of Superman is contending with. And to be honest, I think that's a really interesting idea and angle to take this character. Mm, Bruce Wayne meets Clark Kent. Ah, I love it. Lex Luthor. <laughs> no! Jesse Eisenberg. Okay, where do I start? Jesse Eisenberg is a ridiculous choice for Lex Luthor. And before I dive into this, I should make it known that I have no idea what the actual Lex Luthor in the comics is supposed to sound like or act like. However, I am familiar with a little, or should I say, small show from the early 2000s entitled Smallville. And in that show, Lex Luthor came across as more of a cerebral, emotionally stunted, hyper-intelligent, troubled man. Not a flamboyant, eccentric megalomaniac. In this film, Jesse Eisenberg plays him with the same energy and vigor as a Mark Zuckerberg on Adderall and ecstasy combined. And I mean, I totally understand that that's largely what they're going for here, a young tech mogul type with a psychotic streak, but at no point does he even remotely come close to the appropriate levels of emotion for this character. And what's more is Jesse Eisenberg is a ridiculously strange choice for this role. He comes across as something more akin to a Riddler or Joker type character than the suave maniac Luther typically is, where the madness sits beneath the surface. Well, you look nervous. Is it the scars? And concerning Eisenberg, I wouldn't even say his performance here is necessarily bad or anything. He's clearly a talented actor and performs the character he's being directed to perform. But the vision for the character was all wrong. With that said, even though this character is nothing like Lex Luthor, I do like what it offers the story. A paranoid and corrupt man hell-bent on controlling what he can, even when he can't. The bittersweet pain among men is having knowledge with no power. Because... Because that is paradoxical and, um... <laughs> yielding lines with which we can better understand the character like this. While delivering a speech full of half-truths, he trips over his words momentarily with a clear conflict descending over his face. And in that moment, speaks authentically. He's driven by similar urges to that of Batman in many respects, which is fitting as Batman plays right into his hands when he manipulates the world of those two characters quite effortlessly. Which, ironically, is perhaps the most Lex Luthor thing he does in this film. There are moments where the ball drops and suddenly we all realize what's about to happen. What a sick sense of humor decorating a number of the choices he makes to either take out or frame his adversaries with. Take this courtroom scene, for example. He wanted to frame Superman in this instance and take out this woman standing in his way. There was no need for the jar of urine disguised as peach tea sitting there, but he did that as a power play. To call back to an earlier conversation those two shared, to throw her own words right back in her face before she dies. To show and prove to her that he was always in control. That's the kind of person we're dealing with here. However, and this is a big however, while there are some upsides to this otherwise perplexingly inaccurate depiction of Lex Luthor, what this character offers the ending for me makes absolutely no sense at all. And really, only serves to add a profound air of contrivance to the final battle with Doomsday. Lex managing to infiltrate a weird Kryptonian spaceship and understanding in moments how to use it to resurrect slash create his own monstrosity using its technology feels extremely contrived for the plot. It's not like it's intuitive either. Bearing in mind he slashes his own hand, pouring his own blood over a corpse floating in yellow goo. Am I expected to believe that he managed to infer this by instinct and a quick crash course in Kryptonian bullshit? It's a ludicrous story stretch. Batman vs Superman. 
As I mentioned moments ago, the action in this film is really where it shines. Say what you want about Snyder's color palettes or his directorial style, but the man knows how to shoot and direct an action scene. I love the way he shoots so much of the Superman vs. Zod battle from the ground as if seen by a passerby. It really helps to create this unique sense of awe and spectacle to the occasion. Furthermore, and this is a small personal choice I liked, when depicting Metropolis and Gotham from afar or within, he took specific care to light them accordingly, shrouding Gotham in shadows and Metropolis in sunshine light versus dark, just like the characters each city represents. But where this film's action and nerdiness shines is in the fight between Batman and Superman, sponsored by Jesse Eisenberg. Again, similar to the opening of this film, this fight was one of the two parts of this movie that I actually liked. Although I did say at the time that the fight between Batman and Superman was a little on the short side to justify the title. Seeing it today, however, I am a lot more forgiving. The title Batman v Superman isn't implying fighting, it implies conflict. And those are two very different things. Outside of fighting physically, both Bruce and Clark contend with each other either directly or indirectly numerous times. The two characters are clearly facing their own individual and in many ways diametrically opposing personal issues, which meet a swift resolution once they do eventually come to blows. Despite disliking or finding parts of this film's narrative confusing with regards to its ending, I didn't see much wrong with how they built up the friction between Bruce and Clark in the first place. What draws them together isn't their shared hatred, but it's another reason. Bruce and Clark meet as I mentioned in a party scene, but later too with Batman chasing down a criminal and Superman trying to send Batman a message. Both of these encounters are spawned from their innate desire to do good. However, the conflict of the film stems from their personal issues I alluded to earlier, that they need to rectify if they're going to be capable of reconciling their respective issues with one another. And these scenes prior to their ultimate fight together, while they range in tone from suspicious of each other to downright intimidation, the only reason these encounters happened at all was due to their shared desire to better the world, which I thought was a fantastic choice. The fight that takes place in this film between the two is fittingly well choreographed and shot. Better, I think, than any Batman film I've seen to date. That scene where Bruce fights a host of criminals in the warehouse is exactly the sort of energy I was looking for from a Batman action sequence. Gone are the slow, awkward encounters with extras confused all over the place, and here to stay are some truly jaw-dropping action scenes. Furthermore, in the fight between the two titular characters, Batman has some brilliant and introspective lines directed towards Clark. He says, breathe it in, that's fear. And you're not brave, men are brave. And how about this quote? You were never a god, you weren't even a man. The story of Batman throughout this film has been how he's lost touch with his humanity that has defined him as a character throughout much of his modern run. Which brings me to the Martha scene. Save Martha! When I first saw this scene, I laughed. <laughs> <laughs> like, a lot. I found it utterly hilarious in the cinema back in 2016, and looking back on it, I understand why. The original cut of this film for theaters was two and a half hours long, while this cut I watched today was three hours long. And within that extra half an hour of content comes some crucial part of the story that never got given the chance to really flourish. The intro has possibly the biggest change within the Africa section, introducing a lady that lost her family and blames Superman for it. As a character, she's so integral to painting Superman as a bad character, but but she's not in the theatrical cut, and as a result, the whole Lois Lane subplot makes much less sense. Now, with that said, I don't think the quote Martha line delivery and sudden realization on behalf of Batman is remarkable or anything, but at the very least, it makes sense within the story now. As cringe as that line is, Martha, the mother of Clark, plays a pivotal role in this film, both as a mentor or through reference by his father's vision. The movie goes to great lengths to paint Superman as a man looking for guidance in an increasingly complicated world that paints him as some sort of god, a role he has no interest in playing. On the flip side, Batman's narrative is pretty much the opposite. People see him as a demon that's lost his humanity. So falls the House of Wayne. Bruce's family home is left symbolic of how far he's fallen from the man he once was. He doesn't look at Superman as anything other than a threat to humanity, an alien from another world that can't be trusted, that must be stopped. The Martha line itself serves to paint Superman not as a god among men, but as a person with a real humanity. He cares for his mother, just like Bruce. And in that sobering moment, Bruce comes to realize the mistake he was moments away from making. A mistake that could have cost him not only Gotham, not only what's left of his humanity, but the rest of the world had he gone through with killing Clark, the only person who could stop Doomsday. Uh... The ending concerning Doomsday has some cool imagery, like Clark taking a nuke in the face and being revived by 
by the sun. A scene taken directly from the Dark Knight Returns comic. But outside of that, there's not much else to praise. And that's the problem. Anything that isn't dealing with either Bruce or Superman directly feels contrived, rushed, or misplaced. Wonder Woman, for the most part, is brilliant in this movie and doesn't get in the way of the story being told. But that scene where she goes through exposition.mp4 on the computer is a beautiful example of this film trying to carry more than it's capable of in its already bloated runtime. But okay, I've spoken about this movie a lot already, so let's put a pin in this. The best line Clark has in this film comes by way of his final words to Lois Lane before he sacrifices himself at the end. Throughout this film, he's grappled with why he is doing what he's doing. Naturally, he possesses instincts and morals shaped by the culture he was raised within, but through various conversations with his mother and indeed a vision with his father, he suspects or perhaps fears that his wish for himself isn't his own, but his father's. However, thankfully, his final words lay that to rest. In reference to protecting what's most important to him, he says, this is my world, you are my world. Directed towards his love, Lois Lane, and accompanied by a lone piano in the soundtrack, that moment comes across as stunningly beautiful. While this film did have a lot of issues with its characters and its plot, I was surprised to see my impression of this film change completely after completing this ultimate and extended edit of the film. The fight scenes are clearly the best any Batman character has ever seen in live action, and the final half of the film, while contrived in a few places, is a ton of fun with some interesting storytelling at play with respect to the Batman and Superman characters. And in the end, that's the most important thing in a film about these two characters. In short, I'd watch this movie again. The good certainly outweigh the obviously bad, I'd give it a 6.5 on a bad day or a 7 out of 10 if I'm feeling generous. Oh, okay, finally we're done with this movie. Okay, time to move on to something completely different. So please welcome Joker. Joker 2019. From the purposes of saving my fingers from developing carpal tunnel due to the already absurd length of the script, I'm going to make this review short and sweet. This video is a Batman review after all, and so it's only fair I spend more time on his films where he actually appears. Regarding Joker, people have a lot of opinions on this movie. Some people love it more than words can wield the matter, and others think that it's flat out mediocre or insulting depending on where you stand with its depiction of mental illness. I don't think I'm in any of these camps personally, so what is my perspective on this flick? Hey, Arthur. Yeah. Arthur, can you get a, a look? While I don't think this is the 10 out of 10 movie many might label it as being, I do think this is a fantastic and compelling story. Joaquin Phoenix once again demonstrates why he's one of the most talented and weirdest actors in Hollywood today. There's plenty to appreciate and love about this film, from its cinematography capturing the gritty, grimy realism of New York City where it was shot, to the breathtaking and haunting performance of the deeply troubled main character, Joker. Rightly taking home the Oscar for Best Actor in 2020, Joaquin Phoenix's performance as the Joker paints a contorted and deeply upsetting picture of a tormented and troubled man by the name of Arthur, as he falls victim to a city that has devoured both himself and his mother. There's a lot of social commentary in this film concerning society and what it provides or doesn't provide those that need it. And in a roundabout way, I think that's what I like about this movie. Much like Logan in 2017, this isn't your run-of-the-mill, by-the-books, comic-based film. Instead, this is clearly a story with a specific vision that a director or writer thought was best served by the Joker as the main character. It's not an action adventure or anything remotely related to that. This is a psychological thriller the likes of which I was left thinking about weeks after the credits rolled. But unfortunately, I wasn't thinking about it for good reasons exclusively. Joaquin's performance is a 10 out of 10 masterpiece and the film is shot beautifully. However, my issues stem from the concepts of homage and imitation. If one film is to pay homage to another, that is to take inspiration from a particular idea, I find that it is most successful when done so in a fashion that says something that the other work either did not or could not say. For instance, take Quentin Tarantino's award-winning film Django Unchained. This film takes inspiration from the ideas, techniques, and stories popularized within the old American Western films. However, what makes Django Unchained an homage and not an imitation in my eyes is that this is a film that wasn't and in many ways couldn't have been made in that format during the time period Westerns were popular. 
popular. Or if you want to stick with the superhero genre, we can take Logan for example. Much like Django, it takes inspiration from old western films like Shane. There are other clear inspirations like The Wrestler and Children of Men too, but Shane is deeply entrenched in the DNA of Logan. So much so that the film even makes a cameo in the Logan movie. Shane tells the story of an old gunslinger that rides into town to start a new life before becoming a father figure to another young child. There are integral elements that make the spirits of these stories Logan and Shane similar, however they both, when utilizing what makes their respective stories unique, tell different stories or convey different messages in ways that only their films can. And this is where I think Joker blurs the gap between homage and imitation. Looking at Joker, it's plain as day that Todd Phillips, the director of Joker, took elements from the films Taxi Driver and The King of Comedy, both directed by Martin Scorsese. Because of this, some of the best cinematography in the film takes explicit cues from these films, such that the directorial language mimics Scorsese's to an almost obsessive degree. While also, from a story perspective, because these films cover subject matter that is so similar to that of the Joker, it's difficult to discern what this film brings to the table that the other films would not have. Furthermore, it's even more difficult to imagine what Joker might have looked like or would have even tried to say without these films having already clearly blazed a trail on which this film so elegantly dances upon. Now, in saying that, I'm not suggesting that I didn't like the Joker at all. The King of Comedy and Taxi Driver are some of my absolute favorite films, and to see a modern spin on these ideas with a Joker twist was quite interesting. I really liked the muddled nature with which Joker's thoughts blurred the lines of reality and delusion seamlessly. It served to really enhance the story that was being told while building Joker up to be the sympathetic monster he eventually becomes and wanted to be recognized as. And I guess I liked that the film's story could very well have been a lie told by Joker in a hospital towards the end. I I just would have preferred or found it more interesting for this film to feel more like it had something unique to say or had more of its own visual language incorporated into the film. Todd Phillips is clearly a talented filmmaker and I really do believe he's going to be making some fantastic films in the future, but when you compare his other films to this, these feel like Todd films while this one here distinctly feels Scorsese. Having said all of that, I still really liked The Joker. I think it's one of the few comic book films that could actually be viewed by anyone and everyone over the recommended age, and with an award-winning performance by the Phoenix Man himself, there's a lot to respect and enjoy. My final score for this film is an 8 out of 10. Now it's time to watch something I've never seen before. That's right, I'm talking about Zack Snyder's Justice League from 2021. I haven't even watched this film yet, and I'm already exhausted just looking at its runtime. Way back when I first watched Batman vs Superman in theaters, I had such a bad time watching that film that I pretty much gave up on all things DC after that for quite some time. I did end up seeing Wonder Woman through a friend, and to my surprise, I actually had a great time watching it. There are some truly awesome scenes in that film, not just including the No Man's Land scene, and I thought Diana's Wonder Woman was a truly sweet and good hero for us all to follow along with on these adventures. This in turn gave me hope in 2017 for the Justice League film. And that's when my friend told me about his experience. He didn't like it. In fact, for your entertainment, since I never saw the original Justice League, I asked three of my friends if they could give me their one sentence review of that movie. These are those reviews. Friend number one. Justice League is like a wolf in sheep's clothing, something totally different twisted into a watered-down joke fest with no soul and a blatant attempt to recreate the magic of the Avengers with which it falls short in every conceivable way. Friend number two. This film is carried by its character interactions but ultimately falls to pieces with no real central driving force and a villain with so little presence that any sense of a Justice League level threat is completely non-existent. And finally, my personal favorite, Friend 3's review. I pirated it and I still felt ripped off. Great reviews guys. So if that was the general impression from fans of the characters towards the end of 2017, let's see how my feelings compare in this Zack Snyder cut. That was a fucking wild experience with some truly brilliant moments. And that's not to say that I didn't have my issues with this one from time to time. I bet this is a common complaint, but the first 90 minutes to two hours of the film really dragged for me. With that said, I knew exactly what they were doing, establishing the main cast in Steppenwolf, The Flash, Aquaman, and Cyborg, who all play very important roles in this film. And they do a really good job of that in this movie. In addition to reintroducing Wonder Woman who's saving people, Batman who's recruiting people, and Superman who's super dead now after the last film, the structure of this movie, particularly in the first half, interests me to an almost pathological degree. This is a four hour film. And boy, did I feel every agonizing second of that time. 
this film is broken into a series of chapters and due in part to that I don't think I can see this as a film but instead more like a hybrid of a series and a film put together. It's like this ridiculous high budget TV program that someone cut the intros off of slapped them together and called it a day. It feels extremely thorough in explaining what's going on and showing what people are doing almost to its detriment. Like you know with books they usually adapt the material to work for a film? Well this feels like a book in many ways that didn't adapt its material for the screen. And admittedly this does have a lot of positives. Before this film began I knew virtually nothing about half of the individuals that made up the Justice League proper. Aquaman, Flash, Cyborg to be exact. And due to this film being effectively long enough to jam two average length feature films into, these characters all felt fully explored before the plot demanded anything significant of them. There are also some really, really cool quotes. This one, for example. I can't sit here watching you run in place for some dead-end dude who's not going anywhere. That's a fantastic quote from Flash's dad because it lets us know exactly what Barry's been doing in a very efficient amount of time while also telling us a bit about himself. Or how about this quote? I've spent enough time trying to divide us. I should try to bring us together. A wonderful line from Batman that speaks to the growth his character has undergone while also helping us to understand his role in the group. He's a leader, a facilitator, someone that feels a deep responsibility for this world and these people. Cyborg gets a ton of backstory in this film also, and it's to the film's benefit for sure. There's this scene that shows him running down a football field, and I swear that's the most Zack Snyder thing I've seen since the 300. In fact, that specific shot I'm sure was in both films. However, with that said, I don't think this film justifies its runtime at all. There are scenes like when a bunch of Scandinavian women sing to Aquaman, or when Steppenwolf fights a bunch of Atlanteans, or Wonder Woman telling us what happened once upon a time thousands of years ago, and it's just not that interesting to me. I understand that this is all part of what builds up the midpoint climax and ultimately the conclusion of this film, and yet I can't help but feel like this film could have shaved off 45 minutes and seen some massive benefits. The first 90 minutes of this I found to be a real slog, and by the time I got to the halfway point where things really started to pick up, while I enjoyed it, I needed to take a break as the movie hadn't progressed in a significant enough fashion to entice me to hang on any further. Is that a problem? Well, it depends on what you want from a movie, I guess. On one hand, I found this film to be quite long-winded, but at the same time, I've become captivated by the journey this film has undergone. And this was something I only recently learned about thanks to my friend who filled me in on everything. Originally planned to complete this, Zack lost out on his original vision for this film due to the tragic death of his daughter, forcing him to step away and leave the production to Joss Whedon. The finished product ended up sucking tremendously, and Warner Brothers basically canned the entire franchise there and then as a result. It took fans years of complaining to get Warner Brothers to allow Snyder the chance to finish his original vision. And so, as a result, this is very much a completely unrestrained film that tries to do everything it can with the knowledge that there ultimately probably won't be more. And so, while that doesn't invalidate how you or I might feel about this film's long-windedness, I think it's kind of nice to have a properly auteurial superhero movie that holds nothing back. Justice League versus Superman. Right before the Justice League fights Superman after he gets undeadified, the team unite against Steppenwolf to close out the first two hours of the film. That unification sort of acts as the midpoint climax, and to the film's credit, I really thought that was a strong moment. Much needed too, as they up until that point hadn't been seen much together. And at that point, I was also concerned that this film wasn't going to create any moments for the team to actually talk to each other, to converse, to argue, to really explore their dynamics. However, thankfully though, they get to do just that as they deliberate over what they ought to do with Superman. Superman. Cyborg and Aquaman share some tender moments together along with Flash, Diana too with Bruce, and it's moments like these that really make me want to root for these characters. And I needed that because Superman was awesome in this movie. The revival of Superman with the Justice League's subsequent fight against him might be my favorite part of this film, save for the endings fight perhaps, both of which happen to include Superman. Watching Clark body literally everyone in his team with ease shows just how powerful he is when he's not restrained by his humanity. Not to mention how scary he can be. Flash was someone I thought was incredible in this film, by the way, and facilitates some of the best moments in the entire movie. I swear, when Flash runs past Superman at a ridiculously fast speed and Clark's eyes tracked him, I actually got chills. It was such an incredible moment, capped off by the most important thing in his life, bringing him back from the brink, Lois Lane. Justice League versus Steppenwolf. There's a moment in this fight that reawakens something inside of me that I thought had died long ago. This childlike sense of wonder when looking at a superhero. 
and it was for a character I never felt a strong connection to. I told you all earlier in this video that Superman was my brother's hero, while Spider-Man was mine. And to tell you the truth, I never really understood what he saw in him. I could only speculate based on what he told me. However, in the closing moments of that fight, with everyone on the back foot, Flash waiting on standby and Cyborg in a very compromising position, I understood. Not impressed. When Superman showed up at the last second, with me having grown closer to all of these characters, for him to make that save at that moment like that, I lost my collective shit, and I knew I had to record my reaction to this live. Okay, guys, I'm going to be recording my live reaction. I haven't seen this part of the movie. I've seen one hype moment that happens in, like, three seconds, but everything after that, I have no idea. I, start, I, I thought, like, it'd be cool to record my reaction because what happens really fucking blew me away. So, okay. Without further ado, here are my live, unfiltered reactions to the final 40 minutes of <laughs> Zack Snyder's Justice League from 2021. Here we go. <laughs> Not impressed. That was the vote. That was the moment I knew was coming. Oh, this is the hype as shit. Oh, fuck. Oh, this is sick. Like, they're all kind of working together now. Like, it's just so fucking cathartic. This is that option C. This is that option C I was talking about earlier, where he kind of provides that option that, like, you don't even think is possible. Sit the fuck down! Does he heal faster, too? I mean, that would make sense, like, metabolism, but wouldn't that mean that he ages faster, too? Oh, shit. It's that guy from that flashback, like, three hours ago. <laughs> Holy shit, okay. This is fucking huge. Like, the scope of this is crazy. Make your own future. Oh my fucking god, that is such a great line. Okay, yep, that'll work. There's a really nice kind of coming a full circle with all of their characters, you know? Batman, you know, assuming the responsibility of humanity and, you know, wanting to do the best for it. You know, re retrieving his own humanity. You know, Clark kind of like reconciling his emotions regarding his own sense of self and what his purpose is. Wonder Woman's always been perfect, apparently. <laughs> Flash had his nice character arc in this with his dad and him kind of reconciling that he is going to be able to make his own future and make something of himself. Cyborg was able to let go of the past and, you know, that resentment that he has and he's able to accept himself for who he is. I, I can't get used to Willem Dafoe in this movie. <laughs> he bought the bank. <laughs> I think something that this movie did really well was uh, assign time proportionately and appropriately to each individual character without one feeling more slighted than the other. Like, they gave a lot of backstory to Aquaman, Flash, and uh, Cyborg in this movie that was much needed. Batman sort of took a driving role which made him have utility in the movie because, I mean, he doesn't have a lot of powers, but he's got a lot of resources and he brought everything together. And Superman obviously is Superman, then at the end making, like, one of the best action sequences I've seen committed to a superhero film, so... Everything seemed like it had its place and was really kind of part of everything. And obviously then Wonder Woman was Wonder Woman and she is great and everything. She might actually be my favorite of all of these characters. What? What the fuck is happening? That was sick. That was a sick movie. Okay, credits. Okay, let's go. Okay, yeah, okay. Overall thoughts? They had that amazing ending and... That really weird dystopian ending that I don't know how to make sense of quite yet. Uh, it's it, it this this reads like they want to do another one, but uh, I don't know if they ever will. Uh, if they do, let me know. Overall, I loved this movie. It was a film unlike any I think I've ever seen, and for that reason alone, I'm excited by the fact that it even exists at all. The more variety in superhero films we have, the more opportunities we have for terrific stories to be told in a wider array of ways. This was clearly a film with a dedicated vision orchestrating its creation and fueled by the passion of millions around the world, young and old. And today, I honestly think I felt a connection to these characters in a way I never thought I ever would. My final score for this is an outstanding 8 out of 10. Slow start, but what an incredible finish. Hey guys, what's going on? Totally not Mark here. I am definitely not making this video like this because I forgot to make a G Fuel commercial. I'm making this because it's perfect. Really high production too, like all the other G Fuel commercials. Please, guys, 
If you guys want to support my channel or show appreciation to G Fuel for sponsoring this video, uh, please check the link in the description and pick up some G Fuel for yourself. I actually use it every day for whenever I do my workout. I'm doing long distance running now, preparing for a marathon. So if you guys want something that you think is tasty and caffeine free, or if you want the sugar variety, then by all means, pick it up in the description down below using the coupon code that I have down there, please. Um, anything else? Do I have anything else? Um, enjoy the video. <coughs> okay, so you might be wondering at this point where my review for Robert Pattinson's film, The Batman is, right? Well, I saw it last night and I am in the middle of making it. And truth be told, I really wanted to finish it in time for this video, but the length of this once again got out of control. But fret not, you won't have to wait long as I will be releasing that review tomorrow. And spoiler alert, it's my new favorite Batman film and might be up there as one of my favorite film experiences of all time. For that and more, please subscribe to stay in the loop. I'll see you all tomorrow with the last Batman review.